talk will focus on the representation of partition in Indian cinemas, its relative absence from our films, and the issues that were foregrounded when partition was indeed thematically addressed. And it's really something which is worth noticing because if you look at the Holocaust, uh, which happened in the West and in Germany, there must be easily about four to five hundred films which has which have been made on that, and as a result of which a lot of public catharsis also took place, and as a result of which it kind of the grief and the pain got universalized by communities of people experiencing the same thing through stories over and over again. Quite by contrast, I mean, we have barely films that you can count on, maybe one finger which really are about the partition. If at all it's been used as a as a plot device, then two lovers are thrown apart or you know something like the other, or it has been used to sort of beat the nationalistic drum, which seems to be quite popular these days. So, but we've really, really addressed the pain and the vicissitudes of the kind of human experience which came along with that. So, what Dr. Bhaskar is going to focus on is essentially, she's talking about three periods. One is in the immediate aftermath, which is 1947 to 61. Then number two, during the new wave period, which is 1973 to 79, and then post-1992, when those experiences of violence and exile became themes for mainstream cinema. As I said, it started getting used as almost plot uh, elements. Using clips from different films, which she will be uh, uh, showing you, uh, she will raise questions like, can the wounds of history ever heal? Really. Serious question, how is cinema as an art form influenced by and in turn influences social and cultural realities? How can films respond to the past in a manner that is meaningful to the present? Something which all of us here, particularly the screenwriters sitting here, continue to struggle with that. that can we have it reflected in the current context and make it meaningful even though we are actually referring to the past? Can films that portray the horrors of history perform a function of public mourning and give voice to desires for reconciliation and healing? I'm going to move straight um, into the into the uh, lecture. I have some points here. This is the abstract. These are the questions. So, which he has already read out. I want to begin by um, uh, citing Ashish Nandi, who called the partition of India the invisible holocaust of South Asia, the invisible holocaust. And um, in this context, I want to also quote Hayden White on holocaustal events. And White says, holocaustal events cannot be simply forgotten and put out of mind, but neither can they be uh, adequately remembered, which is to say clearly and unambiguously identified as to their meaning and contextualized in the group memory in such a way as to um, reduce the shadow they cast over the group's uh, capacities to go into its present and envision a future free from the, its debil debilitating effects. Um, it's a quotation which, which I feel is extremely relevant to the subject that I'm presenting today. And, and hence, um, I've always found this particular discussion uh, by Hayden White very, very relevant for us in South Asia. Let me begin, uh, I don't have to, in India and here, I don't have to uh, sort of elaborate too much, but we all know um, what the partition actually meant. 16 to 20 million displaced, 1 million killed, Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs. Um, unofficial estimates are at 3 million, 1 million uh, women raped and abducted, and, and that is the point that I'm coming to, and that's the point of the lecture here, which is that while historians um, and, and uh, political theorists have worked on the uh, national movement, the transfer of power, the, um, um, the formation of two nation states, um, and in that sense, the partition of India, there has been a relative silence, uh, there was for a long time, a relative silence about the human dimension of the partition experience and uh, in the public domain. And uh, there were some reasons for this. And these reasons were, I don't know if you can see the, the is it visible? Yes. Yeah. yes? Okay. Um, the reasons for the silence was that this was a, a sort of a, a traumatic experience, um, a sort of collective psychic numbing, uh, which uh, prevented people from really being able to comprehend the entirety of what um, 
collectives and uh, groups and communities had actually gone through. So, um, hence a certain repression of the memories associated with an incomprehensible event led to the difficulty of actually being able to talk uh, about it publicly. This happened in the context of families, communities, um, uh, work on the partition that came out later, uh, sites, families that had not spoken about what they had gone through, even between husband and wife, even when in families both the husband and wife had come from partition history, they had never talked about it, and of course not to their children, and so on. The other reason for the silence was emotions of guilt and shame, uh, and these were related to the violence, to the killing, um, having had gone through experiences that drove human beings uh, to forms of behavior that that they could never really accept as their own behavior. Because that behavior, uh, and the only way in which it could be accepted was that it was, these were forms of insanity and madness. That really there was a certain collective madness that led people to behave uh, in this way. Otherwise, how do you explain that neighbors would live for, you know, years together would suddenly turn on each other? The other reason for the silence was that Notions of honor and family honor were um, seen to have been compromised by the partition experience. Um, and the, the, the other reason was that the two newly formed nation states, India and Pakistan, set about the task of nation building and assumed that they could do this by repressing the memories of violence, dislocation and exile, and dishonor and guilt that the people had experienced. So a, a very conscious attempt to turn away from the horrors of history, from the horrors of the partition. Um, who, who addressed this? Of course, artists, painters, writers, poets, they did write about the partition. We have novels, we have lots of poetry, we have lots of short stories, more than novels, we have a lot of short stories about the partition. And Manto Fez, Intazar Hussain, Kushman Singh, so many others, there are so many names of people, uh, of writers, artists who addressed this constitutive experience of the times. Constitutive in the sense that it actually formed the two nation states. And not enough was, um, not enough importance was given to the constitutive nature of the partition at that time. In cinema, in films, and uh, the title has Indian cinemas, but uh, actually most of the examples that I'll be talking about will be Bombay cinema. Um, one, I will speak briefly about Bengali cinema and mention one Punjabi film and uh, two or three South Indian films. So, uh, largely Bombay cinema. Uh, in the films that were made immediately in the aftermath of the partition, um, there were a few examples of films, and I'll talk about them, that responded directly to its experiences. But largely, it was obliqueness and indirectness that were the modes of representing the existential experiences of those who were dispossessed and dislocated by this historically traumatic experience. For instance, let me give an example of Avara. Avara, Raj Kapoor's Avara, 1951, has nothing to do with the partition, right? But the abduction of Leela Chitnis, who is uh, Raj Kapoor's mother in the film, that abduction in 1951 and the suspicion of her husband that the child she bore is not his own child would have resonated, you can imagine, in 1951 to the experiences of women who were abducted and who then gave birth to children and were not accepted by the family, their own families. So this, the theme must have resonated in the film which was actually not about the partition. So there were ways in which in the films of the time actually responded obliquely to um, to this experience. Um, so there were also narratives of abduction, lost and found narratives, families separated, orphaned children. Actually in the cinema of the 50s, it's amazing how many films have orphaned children. Children uh, who have no parents, um, adults who have no parents. And uh, these are tropes in the films from the 19, late 40s, through the 50s, particularly in the 50s and even in the 60s, that these tropes circulated in the Bombay films of the time. So the cataclysmic history of the partition was um, responded to in very indirect and oblique ways, uh, apart from a few films that were directly, uh, that also directly dealt with this. What is your
your understanding of what I call the blind spot that popular cinema particularly, I mean mainstream, what you call Bombay cinema, has had towards the issues of partition. Why is it that huge films in the West with big directors, big production banners and big stars, I mean really top stars, you know, they played those roles whether they were in concentration camps or, you know, yeah. those Holocaust related things. Why is there this blind spot here? Um, I think, of course, there are different periods, different phases in which, you know, the answers would vary and they'd be different. But I think fundamentally, uh, and at the beginning, it had to do with the fact that there was a um, hesitancy to deal with uh, what, or deal with an issue that was perceived to be really explosive, which is the Hindu-Muslim relationship. And uh, also, I think, it had to do with Bombay cinemas, um, in a way, one one can be cynical and say that it was, um, you know, they they wanted to keep uh, their own profits in mind when they were making films. If one had to be cynical, but one could also be less cynical and say that there was a certain kind of secular discretion. And this is a phrase that's not mine. Uh, it's Ravi Vasudevan's phrase: the secular discretion that prevented um, filmmakers um, until until very recently, until the 80s actually, from addressing the very, very naughty issue of intercommunity relations. And I think both the difficult question of intercommunity relations, politically it was not resolved, it had not been resolved even today, it was not resolved after partition. And so the history here uh, it's a little different with the Holocaust, but the history here um, is is different and, and because it is still so contentious and because we haven't worked through those memories and, and actually been able to understand what uh, led to the partition and why human beings behaved in the way in which we haven't mourned enough, we haven't um, done penance, I think, uh, for what happened in the past. And we have also, I think, allowed uh, the memories of that violence, because they were repressed, um, those memories to be uh, mobilized and appropriated for political agendas in the 80s. And, and hence, I think, the questions are very difficult. Um, Hedam uh, is a wonderful film. I think it's a really brave, very important film. It is a complete flop at the box office because it deals with a history that we don't want to accept. We don't want to accept the fact, the very fact that we did what we did to each other, Hindus and Muslims, that Hindus and that Hindu Brahmin killed Gandhi, the role of, we don't want to accept it. Even today, we don't want to accept it. Politically, the fallout of that today is before us to see. So I think, I think the, the reason is that it's too difficult, too messy, too much at stake for filmmakers to take. I, I remembered having two conversations, public conversations with Kamal Hassan. And the first one was on Hiram. And he was so, so disappointed is not the word. I mean, he was so devastated by the response to Hiram. And, and he, you know, sort of talked about why he'd never make a film like that anymore. Because it's, there's, you know, financially, economically, in every sense, uh, it's, it's a project that, um, you know, ruined him in many ways, and uh, but it was it's very close, and he returns to Hiram again and again. If you actually have a long conversation with him, he returns to Hiram again and again, and, and it is a very important film. So I think I think that is the reason. So I I I think as a country we are different. Look at Germany today. I mean, look at what Germany has. If you look at the history of German cinema, new German cinema from the 70s onwards, they went all out to address some of these issues. So the Holocaust films are not made necessarily only in Germany, they were made in America. They were made by Jewish filmmakers. And you're right, and there was a whole sort of catharsis that's continuing. And, and these films have come out from Hungary and from Czechoslovakia and Poland and all, all of the European countries affected by it. But um, um, I think Germany's role has been very important in acknowledging what has happened and, and confronting and confronting it and museumizing it and and you know 
Have we done that? We haven't. We haven't done it. Which it's is what the, uh, I mean, Bisham Sani is an yeah. opening, if you remember the uh, yeah. super text which comes yeah. on Dhamma, it yeah. says those who forget history yes. Yes. are condemned to repeat it and, and aren't repeating it. And we are repeating it. We, yeah, are repeating we, are, it. we don't need an external partition. We are I mean, partition. I